um, that's why I keep writing down this table, this analogy between translation and rotation, that's your best guide towards to getting some sort of a grip on rotation. So let me write this down again. Analogy between um, rotation and translation. Um, today, I'll start out with the translation. So with the translation of motion, we have covered this. Position, uh, velocity, acceleration, they are all vector quantities. Um, these cover kinematics, describing how objects move. And we covered force and mass. These were uh, necessary to describe dynamics. How do you cause motion to happen? And after we have covered this, that's uh, through like week seven, and we started covering uh, conservation laws. So when you talk about conservation, then we define the work, defined as force, dot product with the displacement. And we defined um, energy, well, we didn't define energy, we started describing energy, and one of the expression for um, energy that's uh, relevant in comparing these two is kinetic energy. There is something we are going to now call translational kinetic energy given by one half mass times V squared. And finally, so conservation of energy and we cover the conservation of momentum. There's a quantity we define as momentum mass times velocity. Um, there's one more thing here that we didn't write down last time. Um, there's a, what, so you know, I can start writing down some relationship between the quantities. Like if I have position, then the velocity is rate of change of position. Acceleration is rate of change of velocity. Um, how did we describe force? Okay, yeah, net force is mass times acceleration. So if you have only a single force acting, that will give you the acceleration. Uh, mass, oh, I guess this is uh, just uh, tied to that. Um, so this is more or less a comprehensive relationship between all the quantities we introduced in translational motion and sort of their interrelationship between them, except for one. And it's uh, actually the most important one. Anybody remember? I know this semester I spent some amount of time on it, um, but it's very easy for people to have, I don't know, not thought it was important when I first mentioned it. Do you remember what I told you about this? This is like the, the only time I, where I, uh, uh, where, where I um, confessed that I was lying. Um, what do you remember about describing force as mass times acceleration? Is this always correct? Or are there some uh, very rare situations where force is not equal to mass times acceleration? Ratana? Hmm? Yeah, the rocket example, right? Where the mass changes, it turns out force is not equal to mass times acceleration. That's where I was admitting to you guys that this is not always true, but uh, we started out with this anyway. So how do, you actually, how do we actually describe force so that it's uh, actually true all the time? There's never an exception. Asia? Yeah, rate of change of momentum. So, you know, momentum got introduced way down here, but now that you know what momentum is, we have, so, you know, this was a few weeks ago. We described the force correctly as rate of change of momentum. And this is the actual definition of force, that you know, this will never be wrong. So once you have momentum, then now you have a way of describing force. I'm highlighting this because understanding this relationship will be important for understanding something we are going to cover today, which is quite unintuitive. I did a quick demo at the end of class last time, I'll do it again, but it's quite unintuitive. And uh, I'll tell you, the first time I took lower division physics, I didn't really understand it myself. When I finally felt like I understood it was when I was, um, somebody, I don't know when I learned it. Somebody told me how to analyze this motion this way. So, you know, just so that you know what I'm talking about. It's in the pre-session that you saw last time. Remember, right? So you have an intuition for how this should move, right? 
if I simply hold here and let go, how should this move? It should swing down, right? Right? And that's consistent with actually everything you know. So, you know, let's uh, take this wheel. I'm going to need a figure later, so let me just draw it now. So, let's take this wheel, and you are looking at the wheel head on. And let's say you are not, you know, the wheel is not rotating, it's not doing anything funny. There's the axle here. And um, it's, uh, the wheel is supported from one of the ends. So there's going to be some kind of tension force that's acting on the wheel, holding it up. When I let go of the wheel, um, does it make sense that the wheel rotates? Is there a net torque on the wheel? Where is the net torque coming from? What force is providing net torque? Steven? So you, well, so tension could be providing net force. So I guess I should be a little bit um, clearer. So whenever you talk about torque, you have to first define where is it rotating around, right? So I, when I hold on to here, I'm trying to make this a fixed point, right? So, I'm so it makes a sense to make, describe it as rotating about this point, yes? So let me describe the point where the string is attached. Let me describe this as my center of rotation. In the case, can this tension force provide any torque? No, lever arm is zero. So there must be some other force. What's that other force? Gravity. Yeah, there's force of gravity. Where would you draw gravity as, a, as acting here? Center yeah, center of mass. So somewhere around here is where you would say, uh, there's gravity acting on it. And um, so if I finish my drawing, this is my lever arm for the gravity. Um, so, uh, so that's why there's a net torque on the wheel. And so when, you, when I let go, what's the direction of net torque? Now from your view, counterclockwise, right? Or yeah, counterclockwise. So that's what you sort of expect to see. So counterclockwise, Angular acceleration is what you expect to see, and that is what you would see, right? So the counterintuitive part is this. So you know, when this is not rotating, that's what happens. Nothing funny. Good, we can move on. But the um, the motion that you are going to see now, uh, I said it out loud the last time, but I realized watching the video, I never wrote it down. Uh, it's something called precession. So we are going to analyze precession with the tools that we are going to introduce um, in a few minutes from now. So that's the motion you saw last time. So, um, so when I take this wheel, uh, cause it to spin a little bit first, then when I let go, um, it doesn't swing down counterclockwise. When I let go, this is what happens. So, you know, how come is the question, as in, did, did my torque change? So in this free body diagram, when the wheel is spinning, does this free body diagram change? Did any other forces change? Is the gravity changing? No, gravity is constant, it's the same value. And I'll just tell you that the tension didn't change either. So the free body diagram didn't change, so the net torque didn't change, but somehow something in the motion of this works out so that um, something in the dynamics of this wheel works out so that when I let go, it's not swinging down counterclockwise. But this is what I'll tell you now. There is still counterclockwise torque. And the motion you are seeing is consistent with the counterclockwise torque. So this is where we have to introduce the new tool we are going to introduce. Uh, so let me finish this table. And when, so I have pointed it out pointed this out last time, that with the rotational quantities, we have not been treating them as a full vector. We've been saying, you know, a counterclockwise and clockwise, but that's just a one-dimensional way of describing it. You know, if you are looking at a particular plane, then you can say counterclockwise or clockwise, but that's it. If you somehow start, so that's the challenge here. So when you look at this wheel, you can say it's spinning counterclockwise, now, when I rotate it around this way, it feels like it's rotating in a different direction, right? But we cannot say counterclockwise or clockwise because we are limiting ourselves to one-dimensional view. Now we are going to introduce tools 
that will let us describe this direction of rotation in full three-dimensional sense. So let me finish this table here. The analogy goes from position to angle, um, the velocity to angular velocity, acceleration to angular acceleration. Uh, what is the, the rotational quantity, the rotational counterpart to, to force? Torque, yeah, so torque. And we can say the same thing we said before. We could say torque is, uh, oh, uh, what's the rotational counterpart of mass? Yeah, moment of inertia, or I prefer rotational inertia because moment of inertia, it's an old fashioned term. But they are both correct. Yeah, moment of inertia or rotational inertia. So once I have this, then I can say torque is equal to the counterpart to mass, rotational inertia, times counterpart to acceleration, angular acceleration. But just like with the translation, this will not be the definition. The, what do you think, uh, so let me finish this table and I'll ask you, what do you think uh, is how we should define torque? Um, okay, uh, work done, so it would be uh, counterpart to force, so torque. Um, oops, oh, I wrote this as vector. I'll get to that eventually. Torque times uh, change in position, so change in angle. Uh, kinetic energy, so you, you are talking about rotational kinetic energy. That's uh, one half I omega squared, counterpart to mass, counterpart to velocity, so um, just copying down formula that way. And uh, this is where we were last time. So I introduced the, uh, this much that, um, so there's a rotational counter, uh, there's a rotational counterpart to, to momentum. We call that angular momentum. And for some reason that I can explain, we use the letter L. I, whenever I can explain the choice of letter, I assume there's a German reason behind it, but I don't know for a fact. Um, so anyways, momentum is equal to mass times velocity. So we might say angular momentum is equal to rotational inertia times angular velocity. So, um, so this is the rotational version of angu uh, momentum. Now, how do you think this angular momentum is related to the torque? I want you to think about how we came up with all these formulas. Okay, how did, I never actually derived this expression, rotational kinetic energy. How did you come up with this formula for rotational kinetic energy? Arjun, how did you come up with the formula for rotational kinetic energy? Or how did I do it? We use the analogy, meaning I looked at what the formula for, was for translational motion, and I copied this over, uh, changing each one of these terms for the rotational version. So one half is the same one half for both of them. Mass becomes rotational inertia, and velocity becomes angular velocity. Yeah. So, when we are looking for, okay, what is the relationship between angular momentum and torque? We are going to do the same thing here. We are going to look at, well, what is the relationship between momentum and force? Yeah, change in momentum gives you a force, or rate of change of momentum is force. So we should be able to say the same thing, that torque is related to angular momentum by rate of change of angular momentum. And this is where we have to start treating these rotational quantities as fully, um, fully three-dimensional. I mean, I want you to look at this. So I, I won't actually do the pre-session, I just want you to look at the setup. So, so this is the setup where I released it, right? So what direction would you say the direction of net torque is once I let go? 
counterclockwise like last time, right? Yes? Okay, now how would you describe the direction of the angular momentum or direction of, uh, I guess, direction of angular velocity? Would you describe it as clockwise or counterclockwise? Not really, it's not even in the plane that you are thinking of. You are thinking of, uh, when you say clockwise or counterclockwise, you are thinking of this plane here, right? But this is in, rotating in a plane that's perpendicular to that. So that's the, so what we are gonna have to do is we are going to need a mathematical tool that will let us describe something like rotation with a vector, with an arrow that points in some direction in the three-dimensional space.